So thank you for joining us. I love to know where you're listening from. So use that chat feature in the bottom of your screen to tell us where you're listening from. And we're just so excited to have you. We've got some great experts tonight. I want to draw your attention to a few things about our partners, You Health Jackson Children's Care, the Pediatric Emergency Rooms at Holtz Children's Hospital, Jackson North Medical Center, as well as Jackson West Medical Center are available to you 24 seven. I always say, I hope you never need them, but if you do know that at any time, any day, they are available and they're all staffed with board certified pediatric emergency medicine specialists. So parents and kids are getting access to every pediatric subspecialist at Holtz, as well as the University of Miami Health System and the Jackson Health System. So, and interesting enough, the Holtz Children's offers a 24 hour kids only emergency room. So it's great if you have to be in the emergency room and you're with your kid, it's a good place for them to be not in an adult one. So 24 hour kids only and the, the doctors and nurses there are certified in advanced um, life support, pediatric advanced life support. So you're getting top notch care there. And this is new. I'm excited to share this with you. If you were with us for our last webinar, you heard this, but um, you Health Jackson Urgent Care Centers have partnered with UMNSU CARD. So that's the University of Miami at Nova South, um, Southeastern, the Center for Autism and Related Disabilities. They have partnered together to achieve autism friendly designation, the very first in Florida. So this means that the designation, um, the staff at all five urgent care locations are specifically trained and all the centers have a specially designated sensory friendly exam room to give patients the opportunity to experience healthcare in a safe controlled environment. So I just love, it's so inclusive. They're offering something for everyone. So make note of that. I love seeing where you're all listening from. We've got Texas, Miami, Orlando, Panama. I love it. And internationals joining us tonight. So love that. Welcome. And we are so glad you're here. If you'll take one note, um, just kind of a housekeeping for you, but we are going to record this. And so if you watch it and you want to share it with someone or you want to refer to it later, you can come back to jacksonevents.org and you can watch it as well as all of our previous episodes. So share that with a friend. And then at the bottom of your screen, you'll notice a Q&A feature. So if you have a question tonight for our experts, you can slip it in there. We've got tons of questions that we're gonna be sharing. So if, um, if something comes to mind, slide it in there. Um, not in the chat, it's hard to keep up, but in that Q&A feature, and I will do my best to get it in front of the experts tonight. So without further ado, hopefully the kids are getting brownies. Daddy's got bedtime. <laughs> I'm excited to dive right in. So. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, such an important topic, such a topic that I think as parents, we don't always think to ask for help in navigating. Uh, we kind of just think, you know, well, it's just, it is what it is, but there's so much here and we've got experts at our fingertips tonight. So I'm excited to introduce them to you. And our first one is Dr. Patricia Gomez. And Dr. Gomez is a Miami native and she completed her pediatric residency at Children's National Medical Center in DC. She returned to her hometown to complete her pediatric endocrinology fellowship at Holtz at the University of Miami in the Jackson Memorial Medical Center. So she currently works as an attending physician at the University of Miami in pediatric endocrinology. And she has a particular interest in childhood nutrition, diabetes, puberty and growth. So all things that are going to be super relevant tonight. And her research to date has focused on clinical, immune, behavioral, um, psychosocial factors related to the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes in children and adolescents. So um, she's actively involved in the education of medical students, residents, and fellows at the UN Miller School of Medicine. So join me in welcoming Dr. Gomez. Welcome, Dr. Hello. Gomez. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. We've got lots of questions for you. So awesome. Hang tight and we're going to jump right in. But I also want to introduce you to our second expert tonight, Dr. Judith Sim Sindan. She is the Director of Pediatric Adolescent Gynecology at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. And she earned her Bachelor of Science at UM. And then she became a Doctor of Medicine and completed her residency at the University of Florida. So she's Florida girl, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and Dr. Simpson Don joined the faculty at UF's College of Medicine, where she started a pediatric adolescent gynecology clinic. 
So very interesting. And her areas of expertise include pediatric gynecology, puberty, excuse me, puberty and menstrual disorders in adolescents, as well as pediatric and adolescent gynecologic surgery. So two women with so much experience to what we're talking about tonight. Um, welcome. And without further ado, let's jump right in because I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of questions. So <laughs> let's get started. And I want to start with um, just generally, what are the signs of puberty? How do we know that our kids are entering into the stage? So that's a great question. Um, it seems like a simple question, but it's not. In general, the signs of puberty, so there are some signs that are specific to boys and some signs that are specific to girls. The ones that are specific to girls would be breast enlargement, um, vaginal discharge, eventually vaginal bleeding. The ones that are specific to boys would be um, testicular enlargement. And then the ones that both boys and girls can have are adult body odor. So, you know, you start noticing that your child needs deodorant all of a sudden um armpit hair or pubic hair and while those are signs of puberty it doesn't necessarily mean that you're in real puberty the classic puberty that you think of um, so there are other reasons why you might have those signs of puberty um, some conditions that start in the adrenal glands or other things that look like puberty okay. so if you notice these signs of puberty sometimes it's just worth you know bringing it up to your pediatrician or an endocrinologist to see if it's real puberty or to have them sort it out but those might be some of the signs that you'll notice as a parent that suggest that your child could be in puberty. Good. Thank you. Dr. Simpson, I knew you would like to add anything. Sure. I mean, a, a lot of times um, what my um, parents' moms will come in and say is, is, oh my God, she's acting like such a diva um, and she's got breast development and, and I'm like, she wants a training bra and she really doesn't have anything. How come she's, is this really puberty or not? Right. And it can, you know, it, the hormones that really start going with puberty can start depending on your family and depending on sometimes race and ethnicity, what, you know, it can be really different. Um, for some people, puberty starts as pubic hair and for other people, puberty starts as breast development. It just can be really different in girls. Um, I have you know, full disclosure, while I'm a gynecologist, I have raised two boys all the way through puberty. What else should a gynecologist have? Is boys. <laughs> of course. So I, I have been through the, the boy stinky feet and, and everything else as well. Um, and those early signs, even before you start seeing signs of breast development or, or testes enlarging, are um, coming from what Dr. Gomez mentioned, your adrenal glands. Um, they wake up even before in girls, their ovaries or boys, their testicles. So you can get that stinky feet, a little moody, even sometimes a little early breakouts um, of acne, um, even before they've really entered puberty. And that's pretty much normal the process. It'd be great if puberty happened in six months, but unfortunately, newsflash, it takes you. <laughs> get through. Yeah, interesting to know that there's some of those signs, maybe it kind of eases us in, right? It doesn't just necessarily right. happen overnight. Right. So that's good to know, but you're right. It's not over overnight either. So talk to us about what is the best way to talk to our kids about puberty in a way they won't feel awkward or uncomfortable. Like, is there a book or like, how do you recommend having that conversation? Trap them in a car on a long car trip. No, it's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, not, not really. I mean, first of all, I think you have to be open to questions. So, and, and really listening, because some, most kids will ask, you know, can mom, can, you know, if they're a girl, mom, can I have a bra? It's, especially if they're girls. Um, and I'm going to let Dr. Gomez talk more about the boys on this, but being, or, you know, boys will say, mom, can you buy me some deodorant is what happened with me. So we, you know, part of it is sitting down and saying, how much do you want to know about your body? Because you don't really want to make them feel so awkward. And, you know, my kids grew up knowing they had a a gynecologist in the house and is going to explain all this stuff. And I'm, you'll see in 30 seconds, I'm not really shy. So I'll talk about just about anything. <laughs> um, but I, I think being open to hearing what those little questions are, there are books. I, um, and we've got the names of these at the last slide at the end of the presentation. Awesome. Um, but um, I really like um, the American um, girls series for girls, the care and keeping for you of you. I think that oh, cool. it's really 
um, well written. There are, are like the body books for boys and for girls. And um, there's a series that's been out as well, Girlology and Boyology, um, that I think is also really very good. Leaving those kinds of books around are helpful, but every parent has their own comfort zone. So read the books first yourself. Right. So you know what the kids are gonna see. And so you are there and are able to answer some of those questions. Okay, that's great, great. I agree. I think if you make it as uh, like least awkward as possible for them, they'll feel less awkward. Even when they're in the encounter with me, you know, I kind of um, frame it like I have to listen to your heart. I have to listen to your lungs. This is just another part of your body that I have to examine because it's just another normal part of your body right. that doctors will be examining, you know, forever because it's just as important to your health as your heart, your lungs, your brain, everything. So I think the way we model to our children that we don't feel uncomfortable with that topic, I think, you know, they really feel less awkward in mm -hmm. general. That's great. That's so good to hear coming from medical professionals. Cause I know I've heard just in mom scene, you know, have friends that are like, I just want to be that source of truth for my kids. I don't want to beat around and be like, Oh, well, mom doesn't know what she's talking about. So we'll go ask someone else, you know, like I want to be open with them and honest. And if they have questions, we want to, so I love how you said starting there with being open to their questions and, and to go in that way. That's good. All right. Let's talk about one of the joys of puberty, which is acne and mm -hmm. why do kids get acne and what can we do about it? Cause that's, I remember being that kid and my mom, you know, my dad were like, they'll do anything to help me. Cause they just saw what it did to me, you know, and how can we, what can we do for our kids when they start facing that? For you or me? I, 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 either way, well, so almost all kids, when they start to go through puberty, girls or boys, when those adrenal glands wake up, you start making first some of the, they're called androgens, they're the male type hormones, and your skin kind of goes crazy. That's why middle school is just awful for all of us, because our face does break out. It gets oilier. In most kids, our, their skin can get really better with using mild soaps, things like I like to recommend Cetaphil, um, something very mild. You don't want using like harsh things, scratching it off. Um, and then for kids where it's a little bit more pers persistent that that doesn't help, it's like topical benzoyl peroxides, yes. clearasil things that you can find in, and I have no brand allegiance. I'm just saying these out loud because they're things that people have heard before. I usually go with, with that. When do I think a kid really needs to see a physician about acne is, if they're getting cystic acne, where they're getting a lot of big cystic pustules, or they're getting, or you know that like maybe dad or mom had scarring a lot from their acne, and they're getting a lot of big breakouts with a lot of red redness underneath that it's really inflamed. I think it's important to really see a physician. You can start with your pediatrician, um, whether it's a dermatologist or, um, you know, this is something with girls as they get older, we can treat relatively easily using things sometimes like birth control pills help. And I'm not going to give that to a nine, 10 year old, 11 year old going through puberty. But as girls get really older, if it's persistent, there are things that we can do to get the testosterone level down. Sometimes the acne can be a sign that in girls, especially the testosterone may be a, a little too high. Mm -hmm. And so I know that Dr. Gomez, you may comment on that as well. A little bit of mild acne that tends to come and go that gets better with just good hygiene and um, a little bit of benzoyl peroxide, not too much to worry about. Reassurance that it won't last forever. It does get better, exactly. can go a long way. Dr. Gomez, any thoughts? And also taking a little bit of the blame from them because people right. always, you know, tell people with acne, oh, it's because you eat too much of this or you're not healthy yeah, yeah. or you eat too much chocolate. And, you know, kids that age are going through enough stress right. Yeah. Right. to kind of take it off of them and say, this isn't anything you did. It's genetic. Right. Some people respond more to the male hormones in their system. Yeah. Like she said, all, all boys and girls make male hormones when they're going through puberty. Mm -hmm. And just some people respond more to it in their skin or in their hairiness, but it's right. nothing they did. It's nothing, you know, they could have prevented. Um, well, that's good. They come I was in told about say, chocolate. You know, <laughs> my, my grandmother told me it's because I eat, you know, too much of this. And then they, yeah. they feel that, that guilt. You yeah, know? for sure. Yeah, that's great. That's a good reminder. So, um, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. 
so many questions. Like I, they're about to start really coming. I think people are like, okay, they're ready. Um, okay. Here's one we received. What um, does BMI like, uh, is that a factor in anticipating mm. when, you know, hormone triggers begin? I think that's a great question. So for those who you know, BMI is your body mass index. Right. And it basically looks at your um, weight relevant to your height. And the, in general, your BMI can be controlled by different things. So people who are more muscular can have a little bit higher BMI and it's not obesity. So mm -hmm. it's, we have to be careful when we interpret this. But for children who have, especially girls who have a higher body fat, and we're talking about really excess body fat, we, we as women make estrogen in the fat cells in our body. Boys do as well, for that matter. But when girls make more estrogen in the fat cells in our body, it can, we think now, not only just trigger breast development, and it can be hard because girls who are really overweight, sometimes they don't have pubertal development. It's just fat where their breast tissue is. Right, okay. But it can, there is some data now that shows that you can at least definitely get early breast development, that those estrogens may trigger puberty a little bit earlier in girls. Dr. Gomez, your definitely. comments? Definitely. So in girls, um, you know, higher BMI has been shown to trigger early puberty. The way that I like to put it is, um, you know, ultimately the purpose of puberty is reproduction, right? That's what we're programmed for is to have children. So your body as a girl will not allow you to go through puberty until you reach a certain weight because you won't be able to reproduce. Um, so yes, kids who reach that BMI or that weight earlier are at risk for earlier puberty. But interestingly enough, in boys, sometimes being obese causes delayed puberty. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and the, the opposite is true. So kids who are very athletic and have a very low body fat sometimes have a delayed puberty and a delayed first period. So nutrition is definitely important when it comes to puberty. I think oh. that's so key, Dr. Gomez. You don't want to be overnourished and you don't want to be undernourished. Mm -hmm. you want to just be, be healthy. Everybody's body set point is a little bit different. Yes. It's good. Oh, so much here. So many different topics related to this one topic. While we're on BMI, we, we received another question. What else other than BMI can we use to really understand our child's weight or, or determine a healthy weight for our child? So you want me to take it? <laughs> yeah, like, take it so I, I love this topic in clinic because we're not all the same and right. we're not all meant to be thin or overweight or, you know, anything. So I always tell parents, you know, I'm not so concerned about a number because we're not all going to be the same number. Um, and your genes, just like your genes control your eye color and your hair color and everything about you, your genes control your weight. So there's a certain part of your weight that you cannot control because it's in your genes. So what I want for children is that the, in general, they're making healthy choices, you know, plenty of fruits and vegetables, they're active, they're not sitting in front of a, you know, a phone, an iPad, a computer all day, they're at least 30 to 60 minutes per day moving their body, you know, they're making in general healthy choices, because all of us go to parties, and all of us are going to eat a piece of cake and a pizza, but in general, they're choosing, you know, healthy carbs, protein, fat, a variety of food. I don't really like to focus on a number because we're not all going to be the same number. And that's, you know, not reasonable. And you can't control your genes. So, but you can control how you eat, how active you are. And that's way more important than that number. That's great. I, I couldn't agree more. And actually I, looking in the um, Q&A, there's a really good question about how can we be more assertive with healthy eating without having to police our kids? Mm -hmm. So you don't want to be like seen it as like, oh my God, there's such a nag kind of, kind of thing. And then the kids will shut you down. And it, it's really important to have like that healthy balance of encouraging a healthy diet, but you know, allowing for it. vacation is vacation and family holidays and, 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 and whatever. So what do I... I my perspective is this, as a parent, my job was to have healthy food in the house and to keep the junk out. Kids don't have that, that developed brain that puts the break on when they need to have control. And this is especially true during puberty. 
So some of the most important things are to realize you can't buy a six pack of Coke, put it in the fridge and then expect your kid not to drink it because you tell them no. Having it in the house, walking the walk, setting the example, even when you think they're not watching, goes so much farther than any nagging you can do. It just lends you such credibility. So if you're somebody as a parent who's maybe struggled with weight, talking honestly about how hard that is and making those healthy choices together and exercising together is really just so key. But I think micromanaging is not great. great point. Anyway. So sometimes I have a kid who's in the same household, one who's overweight and one who's thin. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, no, but this one I give, you know, chocolate milk to, and this one I don't. And I, that's exactly the point I make, you know, it's a family uh, system and we all eat and drink the same stuff and we all exercise the same um, because if not, that child feels singled out, like they did mm -hmm. something wrong. And a lot of times it's not under their control. Yeah. And we should all be eating, eating healthier, not just the kid who's, you know, BMI is in the overweight right. category. Everyone right. should be doing the healthy eating. The mm -hmm. That's right, man. I would say we could do a whole webinar in the, on this and I will say we have, so check <laughs> out jacksonevents.org because there are at least two, maybe three on the entire topic of nutrition. We have people like literally cooking, I think on the, on the episode. So go back and do that. There's great tips there. Um, okay. We're going to keep moving through. Cause again, there's so many topics related to this topic. Let's talk about moods. Why are girls so moody? Why do they act like divas and have bad attitudes during puberty? I, this is one of like the favorite things I like to um, talk about. Um, I always say it's when, it's when the estrogen hits the brain, it does a number on our moods. It's mm -hmm. hard. Um, at the same time, you know, you're developing, you know, the, this desire to be around your peers and to have more of your friends and to have more value. And your peers are also moody. And it's, mm -hmm. um, it's like, I always liken it to having your brain be sort of raw. It's just more sensitive. And when you look at your daughter and go, she is really overreacting. The person who hates her overreaction more than anybody else is herself. Yeah. Most of these girls, when they get really um, overly grumpy or seem like they're overreacting or feel very moody, um, it's really sometimes hard. And I think um, the extra TLC to say, look, it seems like you're having a big bad day. Let me give you a little bit of space. Let me give you some ideas on a way to bring you off the ledge and it's going to be okay. I know that this part is hard. So I think a little understanding. I think the attitude diva thing is a little bit cultural too in our society here. And where I see this sometimes is really hard is some of my patients have families that have come from all over the world right. where being a little sassy or talking back is totally not acceptable behavior. Where here, being a little pushy and a little snappy is culturally a, a thing. So what you have to do sometimes is, is pick your battles as a parent. You know, if there are things to you that are really important in terms of behavior, you have to say, okay, I'm going to tell, I'm going to call you out when it's really not something that I like. And let's talk about why let's, let's have a conversation about it. And sometimes it means as a family, taking a deep breath, walking away and coming back to that conversation when you're both in a better way. I would also say, don't take it personally when kids have that attitude. Another really important book, especially for moms of girls, and I don't mean this to be sexist, but it's written so much for moms of girls, is book by a, a psychologist called Lisa, named Lisa Dahmer, who's amazing. And she is called Untangled, Guiding Girls Through the Teenage Years, where you can really, and it, she does really deep dives into why girls start to feel, um, have these kinds of attitudes, especially relationships with their moms. Um, it, it just is, it can be really challenging, mm -hmm. but it's worth it in the end. They're sweet again when they're 16. Ah, 16. Okay. I was thinking it was going to be like 20. Yeah, they're, they're, oh. awesome, they're awesome. <laughs> usually till around nine, 10 and then okay. nine, 10, they start, it starts to get 11, that tween year. It can to about 14, 15. You're like, Oh, where'd my beautiful, lovely, sweetheart. And she comes back and she's okay. lovely. <laughs> Good to know. Hang in there, mamas and daddies. 
All right. What about this? Um, this question says, I noticed my teenager wants to be alone in his bedroom, talking on the phone, playing video games. Is this normal behavior? Uh, absolutely. It's normal behavior. And again, um, everybody wants to develop their own space, but this is a really good time to talk when you see this kind of behavior about what kinds of things are appropriate to see. If you have any doubt, put parental controls in your computers and in your systems so that kids aren't inadvertently, and it, a lot of times it's even inadvertent, stumbling across porn sites, talk to your internet provider, they can show you how to do these kinds of things. Kids do spend a lot of time on phone and social media. It's really prominent now. And if you are, um, and it can create problems. It can be a social network, but let's face it. When we were kids, if we made a mistake, maybe our best friends knew about it. Maybe it kind of went around the school. On social media, it gets out everywhere and kids can be made fun of. It's really hard. Make sure that your child in this era, as they're getting into middle school, understand, and maybe even, and probably even before, mm -hmm. um, what they sh what is appropriate to post. This is the time to have the privates are private. You never, ever, ever, ever post pictures on sites. You don't go to sites where this is done. You're not cruel on sites. The same things you wouldn't say to somebody in person, you don't post on sites. Um, look at what your kids are looking at. Ask, ask to see what they're seeing. Um, I think it's important to be engaged. Uh, double check the kinds of content that they're looking at. We know our kids are in front of their screens. They were in virtual school all last year. Many of them have to do their homework. So you can't restrict screen time. It's normal that they wanna be alone and build their friendships across screens. That's how kids do it now too. Yeah. And they're playing video games with kids all over the world. But knowing what they're watching, I think is important. Dr. Gomez, but your thoughts? One problem with this age with adolescents is, it's something that you referred to in the last question, is that they don't understand long-term consequences. Right. It's not that they're not listening to you. It's not mm -hmm. that they're not listening to the doctor. It's just that their brain does not understand not that. Developed. <laughs> yeah. right. It's not developed. So they don't understand, oh, I post this now. I may not be able to get a job in five years. They don't care about that. I may not be able to get a job in five years. But what they do understand is I post this now, I may get these privileges taken away. Mm -hmm. So it's now, choosing, yeah. it's choosing your battles, like she said, kind of like when they were a toddler that you chose your you chose your battles. Mm -hmm. You choose what's important to you, you choose your battles and you stick to those things that are important to you with short-term consequences. So yes, I'll allow you to be in your room, you know, on social media, but the moment that I see X, Y, and Z, you know, that privilege is taken away. It's gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's because good. Because they will not understand the long term consequence. Right. That's right. It doesn't matter how many times you tell them, you know, this is forever, you know. So it has to be consequences that they understand. So it's, you know, mutual respect until somebody breaks that, that um, they're part of the deal, basically. That's good. Dr. Gomez, tell us, how do we know if a child needs to see an endocrinologist? Like at what point would you say they need to see someone? So when we're talking about puberty, because there are many reasons to see an endocrinologist, but in puberty, so any concerns that your kid is, you know, at an early age going through puberty or wow, you know, their periods, peers are all going through puberty and my kid has no signs of puberty or, you know, my girl is 14, 15, she hasn't had her period yet, or you're seeing the pediatrician and the pediatrician's like, you know, I don't really like how they're growing at the puberty stage that they're at. So yeah. early puberty, they're late for puberty, they haven't had their period, they're not growing well. Those are all valid reasons to see an endocrinologist. Great. And a reminder to stay so connected to your pediatrician who knows your child and has seen that exactly. whole growth, you know, spectrum. That's good. What about, um, let's talk about growth spurts. Like what are they and when do they typically happen? So the two most prominent times that you'll have a growth spurt is in infancy. You know, it seems like you have a baby and it, by the time they're one year old, they're, they're, they're huge. Proper, yeah. And it's true because they grow the most in that first year. And then growth kind of, you know, plateaus. It seems like you're looking at your kid and they haven't grown for several years. And then the other big growth spurt is during puberty. Mm -hmm. um, so typically, you know, within a year or so of starting puberty, you'll see a, the biggest growth spurt. Okay. That's great. 
um can doc i've heard this but like that you can predict how tall your child's going to be like is that true can doctors really predict and if so what is that based on and how accurate is that you can get pretty close ah, okay <laughs> so i would say um within about you know five to ten centimeters oh um, wow so really it depends close. on how old your kid is so okay. the, the older you are the the closer we can predict um as babies or, you know, two, three, four, five years old, we can't predict that well because we don't know your pubertal progression, your growth history, the bone ages, the standard that we use to predict height is not that uh, established in the young kids. But what we generally use is your height, okay, your bone age, which is an x-ray of your left hand. So that's what the standards are based on. Oh, wow. Um, and, you know, looking at your growth curve and your puberty history. Okay. Does that happen for, I mean, we're not there yet to have little people. So does that happen like at a pediatrician visit that one time they scan your hand or is that like an extra service you do to generally happens if you have concerns about puberty okay. or growth gotcha. and yeah. Where you I, see Dr. Sims? Well, there's a, there, you know, there's a person who put in the chat and I think this is really important. Is it true that when girls go to puberty too early, they don't grow too much? And I think that that's really important um, point. If you notice that your daughter um, is going through puberty really young, like she's starting to get breast development at five or six or seven or something like that, it's really important that you see an endocrinologist like Dr. Gomez or, or you know, or start with your pediatrician um, because yes, we know that girls will go through a growth spurt shortly after they get breast development. And then what happens is with the continued estrogen being made by their ovaries, they actually close their growth plates. Mm -hmm. um, and so by the time a girl has gotten her periods, she's really not gonna grow that much more. And so it is important that if you notice early puberty that it's caught soon so that we can stop it and there are ways to stop puberty until a girl's older until she's 11 or you know or so or 12 to i mean it's different in each kid where you can stop it and then let it restart naturally again um, when she's a little older and has a chance to grow taller it's also hard if they go through puberty really early too because socially if you're having your period in third grade, it can be really hard on kids. And so um, it's really important if you notice these things. I know Dr. Gomez is the expert. In, so, um, so actually that's a good point because the biggest predictor of adult height mm -hmm. is the height that you are at at the onset of puberty. Exactly. So yeah, sure. when you start puberty, whatever height you are at, that's the pr biggest predictor of how tall you will be. So height is a, it's a great point, Dr. Sims. Wow. Let's camp here for just a second. And then we've, we're getting so many great questions from the audience. I want to slide some of these in, um, trying to stay on topic here, but with the advanced bone age, what does that mean? And what does it mean to have like a delayed bone age? So you have a chronologic age, which is, you know, how old you are compared to when you were born. Mm -hmm. um, but then some kids develop earlier, some kids develop later. So the bone age is kind of the window into, into that, right? right? So if you are nine years old, but your bone age is 10 years old, you have an advanced bone age somewhat. Hmm. So you have the growth potential remaining of a 10-year-old, not a nine-year-old as you are. Okay. So your growth is a little bit limited versus if you're nine years old and your bone age is the age of an eight-year-old then you have a little bit extra growth compared to the peers your age. Okay, All right. And those are things that are all, like you said, examined if you have a concern exactly. about delayed exactly. or early onset. Okay, um, here's what, a question we got from the audience. Is there any correlation between stages of puberty and the onset of like panic attacks or anxiety, um, things like that? There is, and it's, it's a complicated question. So yes, we know that when children enter puberty, some of the hormones can trigger increased anxiety or depression. I, you know, I wish it weren't true, but it really can. It is this, and there are girls and women who their whole lives seem to be a little bit more sensitive than others to the effects of hormones and boys too. So I'll cover boys as well briefly, but, but first with the girls, so that in this girl, there are girls who enter puberty, who sometimes all who get moody or have anxiety or depression. 
who also happen to get PMS later on, like premenstrual symptoms, or sometimes have issues after they've had babies with, with mood changes. Or, and so some women we know are really sensitive to the hormonal effects on their brain. And it's not that the hormones are abnormal, it's that the, the brain's response to them is a little bit more sensitive. Um, and so they can have a harder time then. The uh, boys too, there are boys, and I saw that, that you know, there was a comment that can, can this happen? Boys, sure, there are boys when the testosterone starts being made, mm -hmm. they can be more aggressive or feel the effects of the testosterone in their system more as well. All of those changes are compounded by middle school, by everybody else around them having hormones hitting their brain, by the early pressures of wanting to be successful. This is like the time when you start trying out for teams or band or grades start being talked about a lot more importantly. Um, also, there are challenges in families around the same age too. We know, unfortunately, that some families go through separation. Some families have grandparents who pass. It's just an aging part of being part of a family. There's also the social media pressures. What you should do when you have a child that you're worried has an increased anxiety or depression is to take it seriously and to not say, well, it's just a phase they're going through. Mm -hmm. Talk about it with your pediatrician, talk about it with your child, validate their problems. There are some kids who really benefit as they're going through these times, having a little extra counseling to cope with some things. Some kids could be building bullied and then, and, and this is the symptom that they're having is this anxiety, depression, or they're struggling in school. So getting to the root of it, it may be hormonally triggered, but it may also be other things in their life, in their life. And I can't just blame all the hormones. That's right. Mm, okay. Goodness. There's just so much here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit now about, um, you know, we talked to earlier on about like early and delayed puberty and how that affects our child's growth as well as their emotional development. Um, so let's, let's camp there for a minute on early and delayed puberty. How does it affect a child's growth? Also their emotional development, but we had an attendee who also asked, you know, how do you reassure a child who is a late developer? And at what point should you be worried? At what point should you go, okay, maybe we need to see someone, maybe we, you know. So the question of when should you see someone? So, um, the official numbers are if you're a girl and you haven't started puberty by 13, okay. if you're a boy and you haven't started puberty by 14. Okay. Um, but anytime you're concerned, I think it's valid to see someone, um, kids like to compare themselves to their peers. And there's a lot of distress when they see that their peers are going through puberty and they're not. So I think anytime you have a concern, it's valid. Um, there's something to be said also about, you know, like mother's intuition. Um, and you're only seeing the pediatrician at that age, you know, once a year. So there's a huge gap of time in between then, um, that, you know, somebody's not see seeing your child. So I think anytime you have a concern about their puberty compared to peers, compared to your other children, it's, it's valid to bring it up. But officially it's 13 and a girl and 14 and a boy. Okay, talk about, does it affect emotional development? The, the delayed puberty? Uh-huh, early or delayed. Like what does that do to emotional development? So, yeah, I mean, it can. You'll see girls who have delayed puberty who act a little younger or who sometimes feel younger than their peers. You'll see boys, especially who, who in the delayed, they, they, as well, they, they can. And then on the other side, girls who start really early, um, unfortunately, it can be at real risk for um, people who think they're a lot older than they are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, and so having those conversations with these people about safety it's important yeah. as well. Yeah. So the the girls themselves are not at risk to be more promiscuous, right? No, that's uh, a very good point. So you don't have to worry that your child is at risk, you know, to mm -hmm. act out or be more promiscuous. It's just the other's perception of the child. If they're uh, early or if they're delayed. Either. 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 Okay. Either. So um, the other point is, you know, when we're dealing with height or puberty, you know, if you're taller, you look older, or if you're advanced, you look older, always reminding people who have frequent contact with your child of their age, treat them their age, regardless of if they're early or delayed or tall or short. Um, you know, kids don't like to be baby because they're delayed or, or vice versa. 
So just being very cognizant of treating them their age um, and not worrying that because you had a kid who uh, developed early that they're gonna be more promiscuous or, or take those types of behavior. Right. So, so right. I mean, I, I hope it didn't sound that. Thank no. you, Dr. Gomez, for clarifying, because it's really not the girls who are promiscuous. Uh-huh. It's the threat because they have developed breasts and that exactly. they're seeing that other people may think they're older than they are. And yeah. I think it's really important. Good. And speak quickly just to how do you reassure a child who's a late developer? You know, maybe there's some insecurity there of like, I don't look like all my friends and, you know, any, any just little nuggets you would say of here's how to reassure a child who may be a late developer. So first I would, I would make sure that they're going to be a a late developer um, because there's things that can look like a late developer and they just are not actually going to develop. Um, So I don't like to give kids false hope without knowing that for sure. Um, If you know for sure that they're going to be a late bloomer, you know, then just telling them, you know, some kids, like we talked about earlier, some kids have brown hair, some kids have brown eyes. It's just part of you. And don't worry, you're going to catch up to your peers and and all of that. But I would be very careful to make sure that that's all that they are. Mm -hmm. Um, Because you don't want to falsely reassure a child who's very impressionable. And then later they don't go through puberty or something like that. Um, right. And that's still okay. You know, mm-hmm. I have two um, questions that I don't know if they're more like diagnostic and you know, we can't get too into deep things, you know, when we're not actually in your office having an appointment, but I want to <laughs> ask these two to see one um, guest is asking if your male child is taking ADHD medication, does that affect puberty? Can that affect their puberty? Not puberty. Um, okay. I guess indirectly. So it doesn't affect puberty, but some ADHD medications decrease a child's appetite right? So if it decreases the appetite enough that they're not eating enough or gaining weight enough, then, you know, it can have a trickle down effect, but that's only if it's affecting their, you know, caloric intake, their nutritional status is when we see a problem, but the ADHD medication in and of itself, no. Okay, great. Here's another one um, that was specifically for you, Dr. Gomez, for girls with too much androgens like PCOS, um, can they say that they have a mild form of CH, CAH? excuse me. (laughs) So they're completely different conditions. So that's why I was saying that if you ever have concerns, either early puberty, late puberty, abnormal hormones, kind of let the doctor sort it out first, because I see so many times that somebody comes to me and they're like, oh, we have PCOS. And I'm like, well, there's a bunch of things that can look like PCOS. Um, And, and, And we don't diagnose it until they're a few years way out from having had their periods because those androgens are elevated normally in early puberty. So a lot of girls come to me and have been told they have PCOS at age 13. They've only had periods for a year and they're a little irregular and they've got a little acne and you measure their, their androgens, their testosterone is a little high, but it's something they're just going through a phase and they outgrow. So we got to be, and, and looking at PCO ovaries on ultrasound for that thing is, is useless in adolescent girls because ovaries have mm-hmm. lots of little eggs that you see. So we're really careful to mm-hmm. not make that diagnosis early. I'm learning so much. I'm like, I didn't know any of these things. And now I'm, I'm 38 and I'm learning things. So certainly our, our children are going through so much. Um, okay, here was a question too. Um, is this maybe a sign of early puberty, but should an eight-year-old girl have body odor, like armpit body odor? Would you say that could yeah. be a sign of early? So eight is a cutoff for a girl. So if you want to say eight years on one day <laughs> or eight years minus one day, so eight and above is normal, but okay. it's in the whole clinical context, right? Are they, right. do they have body odor, but they also have the breast development of, you know, what you would expect a 13 year old to have, you know, it's the whole clinical picture. Yeah. Body odor at eight can be completely normal, um, but it depends on everything else going on. The big picture. Okay. Great. All right. Dr. Sims, send on, let's talk about menstruation. When uh, should we'll girls work. period start? <laughs> All right. Well, that depends. Girls in general should start their periods about two years after they get their breast development. Okay. So what's happening in a girl when she's starting to have breast development is their ovaries have woken up. They're starting to make estrogen. And just like girls start off with no breasts, their uterus starts off really, really, really tiny. And it's wow. that estrogen that's causing the breasts to grow. And it's also causing inside where you can't see the uterus grow. So usually a girl should start a period about two years after she's had her breast development. Okay. Some girls will start breast development at age 10, 
and then get their periods at around 12. And that's the average in the United States. But when we talk about an average, we're all different. Some girls will start their periods as young as 10, and some girls will start their periods as young as 14. And those are kind of the outer, outer edges of what we usually see. Okay. There are some even earlier and some even later, but I, Dr. Gomez, my, those are my kind of 10 to 14 is kind of the, in there is pretty normal, especially if that's when your mother started her period at age 11, you'll start your period around age 11. These things okay. do tend to run in families. All things being equal, that's about what happens. Now, if a girl starts her breast development at age 10 and hasn't had a period by the time she's, she's 14 or 13, that's not normal. If you start okay. having breast development young and you're not having a period within uh, by around two, two and a half years later, I would see a doctor. Wow. Okay. I've never, I've never heard that. <laughs> like, this is like news to me. This is good. Um, someone asked in our chat, will we be sending this out? Yes. JacksonEvents.org. Give us about a week. It'll be on there. And we'll also email all the attendees the link. So yes, this is super informative. Um, okay. While we're on this topic, let's talk about tampons. Are they sure. safe? Absolutely. And what age is appropriate for girls to start using them? We had a question from a parent, you know, is it recommended from the first one on or you should you wait? Okay. It's probably TMI, but uh, my first period, my mother, I was older, 14. My mother handed me pads. I'm like, this is gross. Um, and so what else is there? Yeah. And maybe that's why I'm a gynecologist now because none of this stuff ever scared me. But I right. um, <laughs> I think, you know, we know that first of all, as soon as a girl's old enough to have a period, her vagina's normal length, it is safe for her to use tampons, all that developmentally is in there. What you need is you need a child who's patient enough to learn how to use it. It doesn't interfere with their virginity. You have girls who are athletes, who are volleyball players wearing little tiny shorts, who really are uncomfortable wearing pads. And you can use tampons very safely, regardless of age. What I don't like to see is sometimes you'll have kids who really don't want to use a tampon and the family's like, we're going to the beach. You got to learn how to use one. I would never put a kid, push a kid into using a tampon before they are ready. But if they're comfortable and you know, there are all kinds of ways, there are even videos on how to do this now online, um, but you can, you teach a child, this is, this is where your vagina is. This is how you use a tampon. This is, I, I actually show them in my clinic on my hand. I like show them, this is what a tampon looks like. This is how you have to put it in. This is, and that you have to change it every four, every six hours. And that you don't do it on light days and you don't, I don't recommend sleeping in them. Um, and you have to teach them about how to use them safely. That takes a degree of maturity and every kid matures at a different point. The great news is there's so many other cool hygiene things out there that aren't just tampons, like there's period panties. So if you have a kid who doesn't want to see a pad, you can wear these, like Thinks is a great company that makes these underwear that really do work and that you don't have to wear a pad and wow. they can't, or you don't have to worry about changing a pad that you can use. There's menstrual cups. Those are usually harder to use. That usually takes some kids who are a little bit older, 15 or 16, but Every kid's different and it depends more on their maturity and their personal desire than their age. And you can use them for your first cycle. Okay, that's good. What about menstrual cramps? When do cramps merit a call to a doctor? Um, well, a lot of girls have cramps. They usually start one to two years out after your periods start usually because the first couple of years after you start having your period, your cycles you're not actually ovulating. It's kind of like your brain's practicing. You make a little estrogen and then it goes, okay, I'm tired. That's enough. Mm -hmm. But, and then that drops off and then you get your period. But about a year into having periods or more, you'll start having periods where you're actually, once that estrogen gets up, the brain goes, I should be popping out an egg. And after you send that signal to ovulate, you make a hormone called progesterone for a couple of weeks. And then when your ovary realizes that you're not pregnant and you drop off both the estrogen and progesterone, that's when girls tend to get more cramps. It's that progesterone drop with your ovulatory cycles. Best thing to treat cramps are usually the day or so before, if you know their periods are coming, giving them ibuprofen or naproxen because it blocks your body from making these really evil, and there are hormones called prostaglandins that make uteruses just cramp. Mm. Other things that are really good are heating pads or, um, you know, walking it can, can actually make people feel better. But if a girl is missing school or throwing up 
or having pain that's interfering with her activities. That is never okay. Yeah. We're gonna be having periods, you know, for 40 years of our life. Yeah. And it's not okay that she's that miserable. If she's having that much pain, I want to know, I want to make sure her uterus is normally shaped. I want to make sure that we are really helping her keep on track. That's great. That's good. Um, okay, man, so much here. I'm thinking, got to go back and take notes again, listen to it again. Um, okay, so to make sure that I'm remembering correctly, early puberty age is considered, we say eight, nine, eight for girls, nine for boys. And then late is 13, 14. Is that right? I get that right. Yeah, got that's it. Test. That's, that's okay, roughly, great. But um, then also, if the tempo is abnormal, that's a different story. So that's okay. roughly when you start. Okay. Okay, that's good. What about um speaking of what is like the um the age to see a gynecologist? Like, at what age should a girl see a gynecologist, and should boys see an equivalent at specialist at a certain age? We usually really like to see our girls around the time they start getting their periods and have these kind of talks, hygiene talks, I mean, um, and, and how to take care of yourself um, and, and what's normal, what's not normal, especially with management of their cramps. Usually by 14 at the latest is when we usually like to see girls, but anytime girls are having a problem, whether it's an abnormal discharge or pain or anything that's like that, we want to know we're, we're here and I... I Anytime. Yeah. And any tips on introducing, you know, this new, like a new kind of doctor we're going to go see, you know, like any tips on introducing that? I think it's really important to hear that we don't always do, you know, women who've had gynecologic exams think that if they're bringing their daughter to me, they're going to have a pelvic exam. And that's not the case. Okay. I mean, I very rarely do a speculum exam on a, on a, on a patient who's um, never been sexually active. I mean, truly there's, if she's got a vagina and she's having a period, I don't need to look. I know that it's, it's, it's there. Um, very rarely there are occasional exceptions. So if a girl's just coming to me for cramps, you don't have to worry that your daughter's going to have a speculum exam. So you don't have to prep them that this doctor is going to put something inside of them and it's going to be, you know, right. Just okay. That's good to know. know. I mean, you don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and it's very common that, that the girls are sitting there like, Oh my God, what is she going to do to me? And, and, and really the vast majority of time, what we do is completely non-invasive yeah. and, um, and, you know, if a girl's having a problem, an abnormal discharge or something, a lot of times we can assess things with swabs that are totally much more gentle than what I think parents think we're going to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody knows what they don't know. So this right? is why we do this. So yes. you can find out all the things you don't know in a safe right. atmosphere. So how great is this, right? Yes. I'm just very thankful we get to pick your brains. Um, okay. We're, I'm watching our clock here. We have about five more minutes. So I'm going to do my best to get all these questions in, but a couple questions from the audience. What kind of conditions would cause a girl not to go through puberty at all? Um, mainly conditions that affect the ovaries, right? Okay. The ovaries don't work for whatever reason. You're born with a congenital problem that your ovaries don't work or you had a chronic health problem that affected your ovaries. Um, kids who you know are cancer survivors or treatment for cancers or chronic illnesses that might affect your ovaries. Um, Great. What about, is it safe to stop early puberty? We're kind of talking about delay, but now early, like is it safe to stop an early puberty? It's definitely safe. Um, it's not always necessary. Um, many times it's not necessary because even though we talked about early puberty potentially limiting your growth, most of those girls are starting off from a taller height than compared to peers. So when we do our calculation, we see, oh, it's not really gonna limit the growth. Um, so most of the times it's not necessary. When it is not necessary, I like to have the conversation with the family because you know your child best, right? So I like to present the information, you know, yes, they are in puberty. No, they're not in puberty. Um, I think it's going to limit their growth or I don't think it's going to limit their growth. And I present everything to the family and I ask them, you know, what are their goals for their child? Because it's not my kid and I don't know that child as, as good as a family does. Um, yeah. Now, if you have a child who's two or three and going through puberty, I might put more pressure, you know, I, this really needs to be taken care of. I don't want your child to have a period at five years old, you know, right. But when it's in that gray zone, I like to have more of an open-ended discussion with the family. Okay, great. And then um, we received the question, 
regarding male puberty, should a boy see like a, you know, gynecologist equivalent, or I don't know what you would call that, but should a boy see a specialist at a certain age? You can see an adolescent medicine specialist, or you can see your pediatrician. A lot of times, those are, those are the best um, to, to really help boys as well. There's not, a, they don't need to see a urologist, but usually the pediatrician or even adolescent medicine specialist, sometimes um, boys feel more comfortable go, as they get older, seeing somebody who really takes care of, of teens. And we have those in, at the university as well. Yeah. I want to, I see that last question coming up on the QA, and it's something that's really important to me. Yes, please. So somebody, and thank you to, for asking about should during puberty, should the HPV vaccine be given? And 1000% yes, because the younger it's given, the more immune response you get, the better antibodies you make, the more likely you are to be protected for a lifetime against cancers for both boys and for girls. It's so key to give it an early puberty. I vaccinated both of my boys at, um, at eight, very young, at 11, when they're, when they're really recommended because it's so important to give them that protection against cancer their whole life. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Okay, I've got two more blitz questions. I see our time, but I think we can do it. You ladies, give me your lightning answers. But um, this is probably for you, Dr. Gomez. Is treatment always necessary for early puberty or delayed puberty? And if so, what does treatment look like? How long does it last? Give us your lightning answer. So not always necessary. Um, you have to look at the whole picture. Early right. puberty, usually it's injectable medication um, in the form of one, three, or six months, or an implant okay. um, doesn't have like significant side effects. Uh, delayed puberty, we're even less likely to treat. Sometimes you can try to kickstart puberty with testosterone or estrogen, but even less likely to treat. But no, it's not always necessary. It's good to have a, a discussion with your doctor. Great. And we talked about nutrition. We know that nutrition is so, so, so important. Is Does it matter organic versus non-organic or is it just nutrition? Nutrition. Definitely not. Definitely not. Doesn't matter. You can be healthy on on you know non or non organic. Great. So I got three dollars on avocados. So, exactly. Now. Sometimes it's such a lie, anyways. The labeling. So healthy yeah. fruits, vegetables, complex carbs. Love it. Great. Okay. Finally, are there any foods or products known to cause hormonal disruptions or endocrine disruptions that we should avoid and be aware of? There are so many, you can't avoid them. They're everywhere. Right. So we kind of have to trust that, you know, people are studying them and trying to remove them from our products like plastics and stuff like that. When I do have a patient who has early puberty, I will ask about certain exposures, you know, lavender, tea tree oil, um, just because why add something to the mix? You know, if they're already in early puberty, let's just take out those potential exposures, but it's impossible to avoid them all. They're everywhere, pesticides on our food and our plastics. Um, so everything in moderation. Yeah, that's great. Ladies, thank you so much. And guests, if you enjoyed tonight, I know you did, um, drop us a little something, just a thumbs up. I don't even know if you can do emojis in the comments or a letter to say was listening, loved it. I know so many of you did. Um, again, we are going to have this recording. It'll be ready to go. Watch your email. We'll send it to you. Jacksonevents.org for all the resources of our previous webinars, as well as this one. Um, we're going to put up a slide here in a minute with those resources, some of those books, websites that will all be helpful for you as you have these conversations with your children, as you're navigating this. Parenting is so hard. We always say at Miami Mom Collective that motherhood is hard but it does not have to be lonely. And so this is one of the reasons we love to bring you resources like this to say, you're not alone. Um, we, we can get the experts, we can learn this information and it's just gonna help us and help our family. So please mark your calendars for Thursday, February 24th. We will be back again. And our episode will be on the topic of safe sleeping. So this is um, putting your baby to sleep in ways that can help protect them from dangers such as choking, suffocation, sudden infant death syndrome. And new parents have so many questions about making sure that they're taking care of their babies. And so sleep doesn't have to be one. Come here. We're going to learn from some specialists. That's going to be Thursday, February 24th at 8 p.m. Um, so you can learn about helping your baby sleep safely. And again, so many topics there at jacksonevents.org. Uh, really the whole gamut, COVID, 
everything and all sorts of um, development. We've got one coming soon about mental health awareness with our children. So just so many great topics. A huge, huge thank you to Jackson Health. Um, you help Jackson Children's Care. Thank you for hosting tonight. And um, Dr. Gomez and Dr. Sim Sindan, we're so thankful that you were here. Thanks for spending your evening with us. And um, all of our guests, thank you for joining us. And we hope you all have a wonderful weekend and hope to see you in two weeks, February 24th. See you then.